Hello, I'm uh, Robert Emmett Hernan. I'm head of Bluestack Productions, the publisher of Irish Environment, an online magazine covering environmental matters on the island of Ireland. And I'm very pleased today to be here in Dublin with Frank McDonald. Frank, how are you? How are you? Good. Uh, Frank was the very first person I interviewed when I started the magazine six years ago because I thought he was an important voice uh, on environmental issues back then and six years ago, and he still is, although he's left us in a way, because <laughs> he's retired in this January. Supposedly retired. Supposedly, but still retired. Officially retired. I thought what we would do today is that uh, I think Frank's tenure at the Irish Times from 1979 until January of 2015 is really coincides with the beginnings and growth and maybe the regression within the environmental movement in Ireland. And so I thought what we could do is kind of retrace uh, your tenure at the Irish Times as a way of getting into that issue. And then at the end, we can come back and see if there's some larger issues we want to trace. And then you joined the Irish Times in 1979. Yeah. Um, and if I recall right, you started a, you started with a series called Dublin, What, what, what Went Wrong? I did, yeah. And that um, was about... I did. And that was... It was essentially... Um, it was a, a, a major series um, explaining... Um, you know, why Dublin was in the state that it was in at that mm -hmm. time in 1979, where, you know, the city centre was littered with derelict sites. Um, there was a relentless process of suburbanisation underway. Mm -hmm. um, historic streets were being pulled down to be widened and turned into bleak dual carriageways. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, for example, of High Street in the old medieval uh, city, mm -hmm. uh, which used to be quite a narrow street and is now a big dual carriageway with, uh, you know, sets of sheep pen style guardrails for pedestrians stranded on traffic islands in the middle of it all and it's just really insulting and I, I thought that the city of Dublin was being destroyed and I came to realise that when I'd be cycling home because I was a sub-editor in the Irish press in the mid-1970s and uh, for three years and I'd be cycling home at one o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning to where I had grown up uh, off Black Horse Avenue near McKee Barracks yeah. off the North Circular Road and um, I suddenly realised that the Dublin that I knew as a kid was being whittled away. Mm -hmm. I mean there were all these sites um, you know around the place there were buildings falling down there mm -hmm. were you know there was just a terrible atmosphere of decay decrepitude and and really mm -hmm. civic negligence involved mm -hmm. in the whole thing and nobody was writing about it at mm -hmm. the time so I just thought well I'll start writing about it. So I did start doing that in the Irish press and then expanded when I joined the Irish Times with that series um, in, in, in 1979, yeah. which really lifted the lid on the reasons why yeah. all of this was going on. Um, and uh, and I, I think it was a very worthwhile thing to do. Now, and you've always had uh, a keen interest in, in, in cities and yes. in, in, the, urban, in the, the built environment mm. in a way. Uh, your, your books were The Destruction of Dublin, yeah. Saving the City, yeah. Ireland's Earth and Houses, The Ecological Footprint of Cities that you edited, Construction of Dublin, then there was Chaos at the Crossroads, which was more kind of... In, Dealt with everything. Yeah, yeah, more environmental. Urban and rural and yeah. everything. Yeah. And then The Builders, which is both yes. kind of the environmental and, and, the, and the city. So you've always had that. But now, when, when did you start to uh, uh, transition into doing stories on, quote, natural environmental issues? Well, I think that um, one of the things that, uh, that arose in the, in the 1980s um, was the, uh, the, the massive air pollution problem that was developing um, in Dublin and elsewhere, but particularly in Dublin, as a result of a specific government policy which encouraged people to install coal-fired central heating, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so we were all burning coal. Um, this, the air quality deteriorated massively. Mm -hmm. uh, it got to such a point in 1988 that, um, you know, some cyclists were wearing little masks and mm -hmm. so on because the, the air was so thick. We were exceeding EU limits by a factor of six mm -hmm. in some cases on some nights, mm -hmm. uh, where there'd be an air inversion and you know all the all yes. the dirty air would be held closer to the ground, mm -hmm. and so on. So um, that was that. I got involved in a campaign essentially to change that, mm -hmm. with a wonderful position from um, from uh, St James's Hospital, Dr Luke Clancy, mm -hmm. and Karen Dubsky. Uh, oh, yes. Who uh, from the Clean Air Group, as it she then, and then subsequently in Coast Watch, yes, and all of that. And uh, 
So that was a major issue which we needed. We needed to turn that problem around, and uh, we did and that, eventually. That, yeah, that led to the to the nineteen ninety ban on bituminous coal. That's right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Except, of course, it being it being Ireland, it wasn't a straight ban. Right. It was a ban on the sale and distribution, but not on the and burning. The, of the, it. Yes, but if you yes. were a little old lady right. and you happened to put some bituminous coal in your grate, you wouldn't be prosecuted. That's you know, right. that was the the thing. You know, it was just. To, <laughs> We're, we're serious about this, but not that serious. <laughs> well, and, and also it was only Dublin at first. Now, it later yeah, was expanded. Yeah, it, it was extended to other places. Yeah. But it's still a problem. And, and it is still a problem, and it's still a problem, particularly in provincial towns, yeah. uh, where, um, where there aren't any uh, smoke control regulations. Yeah. And it really needs to be extended. I mean, there's absolutely no justification, in my opinion, right. for burning coal or peat. Right. You know. Now, you know, the peat is still being burnt not just in domestic situations, but also in, in peat-fired power plants in right. the Midlands. These need to be closed down. Right. So does the coal-fired power plant in, in Money Point, Money Point in County Point. Clare. That needs to be closed down yeah. or turned over to run on something else because yeah. it is the biggest CO2 factory in Ireland. Yeah. It, it emits something like 5 million tonnes of CO2 uh, a year. Uh-huh. And that is, you know, like that, if we got rid of Money Point, Mm-hmm. or replaced it with something else. That would be a major hit in terms yes. of, uh, of Ireland's per capita emissions. Yeah. And, and the peat, my understanding the peat is that it is much more carbon intensive than coal. Even. Yes, of course. And so yes, it's much yes, more yes. dangerous yes, it health, is. health-wise. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And so, you know, the only reason why there was an exemption for peat, of course, was because it was an indigenous fuel. Yes. And uh, But then, on the other hand, we can't be destroying the bogs. Right. You know, I remember in the 1980s going to see the last surviving bog in the Netherlands. Uh-huh. You know, and they had spent, I don't know what, you know, like lots of money trying to save this last little piece of bog uh-huh. a, of a type of landscape that existed and habitat that it had existed in, in, the, in the Netherlands for centuries. And uh-huh. this, they were down to their last kind of like 200 square uh, meters uh-huh. of, of, of this intact raised bog, uh-huh. uh, which they had to support by you know, rewatering the adjoining ground and wow. all sorts of other things. Right. And I remember walking through that bog and this guy, this conservationist, picked a little white bog orchid and he said to me, he said, you know, he said, that orchid cost a million to produce. <laughs> to produce. Because that was the cost of, you know, Preserving restoring it. the bog. Yeah. 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 And they're the beautiful, those yeah. bog cottons things. Um, but now, what other what other kind of major stories in the eighties? Uh, there was the massive problem with uh, um, agricultural pollution. The fish kills and the fish kills. I mean, yes. the, that got really out of hand in the yeah. mid nineteen eighties, um, and uh, the Irish Times was pretty hot on that as well. Uh-huh. Um, and you know, it was just happening as a result of ignorance, really. Yeah. Um, you know, slurry was being uh, spread on land. Um, um, silage effluent was um, escaping, um, you know, into um, water courses, uh-huh. um, streams, rivers, and so on, and massive numbers of fish were being killed. Uh-huh. And you know that eventually led to um, improvements in yeah. at farm level, yeah. uh, where you know it was explained to the farmers that they just couldn't be doing this yes. anymore. Yeah. And uh, but every time there was a major fish kill, we highlighted it. Yeah, Absolutely. And, yeah, and it did lead yeah. to some regulations, which, Absolutely. which was some... some and then the problem. other thing that was happening in rural Ireland, of course, and is still happening um, uh-huh. uh, at an alarming rate, is the um, suburbanisation of rural Ireland through the construction of individual houses in the countryside. The one-off We house. now have one-off houses, and we now have about half a million of them. Uh-huh. And um, that means half a million septic tanks. Right. And that means all sorts of potential for continuing water pollution, mm-hmm. quite apart from the degradation of the landscape mm-hmm. that's inherent in the construction of often vulgar, um, fairly large um, single houses, you know, mm-hmm. now generally speaking two stories high mm-hmm. rather than bungalows, much more, I think it was described, they were described very accurately by Tony Lowe's uh, from yes. uh, Friends of the Irish Environment as McMansions. Yes, yes, know, yes. Because that's what they're like. And they're all mostly built from pattern books. Yeah. And of course, you know, uh, it, it, it was really interesting and very depressing to see that the current Minister for the Environment and his sidekick, uh, the Minister of State for Housing, mm-hmm. um, exempted bungalow yes. builders from yes. having to comply with the... Um, the building regs to yes. the extent that yeah. well of course 
hardly any of them would have got an architect to design their bloody houses in the right. first place. So this this allowed them to get away with not having to get an architect in to inspect that they had actually built it properly, uh -huh. uh, even for the relatively modest fee of about three grand or something, Jeez. which is only a f tiny fraction of the total yeah. cost of the of, of any of those developments. Uh -huh. So you know, I mean, to me, what that illustrated that that exemption that present if you like that bonus for the bungalow builders mm -hmm. what it really illustrated was that the political system in Ireland is just so in such decay mm -hmm. and such decrepitude that of course clientelist politics intervened mm -hmm. um, as it always does yes. you know and these guys Kelly from North Tipperary and Pody Coffey from Waterford uh -huh. are from rural constituencies mm -hmm. yes. so naturally Yes. They're going to fix up their own people yes. to the greatest possible extent. Um, I did a, a series of articles in 1987 called The Bungalow Blitz. Uh, oh, yes. Uh -huh. And that was the first time that, it, that the scale of what was happening uh, had been exposed. Okay. Because at, at that time and um, even since, um, bungalows in the countryside or one-off houses in the countryside consisted of a third of the total national output of housing. Uh -huh. And that has okay. been pretty much true. It's actually, mm -hmm. during the recession, it went up to even uh, 50%. Uh -huh. Because, of course, uh, construction of housing estates and uh, apartment blocks pretty well finished. Right. So one-off housing then became an Absolutely. even larger proportion of the smaller number oh, okay. of units that have been produced on an annual basis um, since the crash. Okay. Now the the other one of the the positive things in this period again in the eighties was the uh, John Hanrahan case where yes. he won that suit against Mer Mark Sharp and Dome yeah, yeah, yeah and, yeah. and it, I, I thought everybody was shocked that the Supreme Court overturned the lower court on that that's true that was um, remarkable. it was and and that was widely featured in the Irish Times uh -huh. and well, it was one of my colleagues John Armstrong who who covered that in detail uh -huh. and of course you know it was um, it was held you know by a lot of people that John Hanrahan was mad, you know, that he, that this yeah. couldn't be true, that there was no possibility that, you know, there was any relationship whatsoever between his, you know, increasingly ill herd of cattle right. and the emissions from this stack. He was a bad he, farmer. In, he, that he was a bad farmer and all right. the rest of it. Yeah. I never believed that. I, I was pretty sure that, that, that there was an yeah. industrial um, uh, pollution explanation uh, for the whole thing. And to what extent do you think the EU contributed to the development of that environmental awareness? And well, I think that I think that things would have been a lot worse mm -hmm. if we hadn't joined the European um, the Economic Community, as it was called in 1973, right. because over time uh, we ended up having to comply. I mean, being legally obliged to comply with a yeah. whole series of EU directives on the environment, yeah. which our European colleagues regarded as being very important, uh -huh. and um, which we didn't really uh, at the time. Uh -huh. uh, but nonetheless, we had to comply with it. So, it, so the, the EU membership effectively acted as a driver for yeah. environmental legislation, yeah. um, because I don't think that some of the stuff that had to be done would have been done otherwise. What the stories there in the 90s that were... Well, there was, a, there, there was I think, first of all, there was a major waste management crisis, uh -huh. um, yes, which, right. which uh, involved, um, you know, really um, a, a dreadful collection of municipal landfills, right. um, which um, were being very poorly managed and uh, mm -hmm. were proliferating. There was over a hundred landfill sites in yeah. the country at, yeah. at some point. Um, and they just being, weren't being run in a professional way. They were mm -hmm. causing pollution, both air and water pollution. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously that was a problem that really had to be tackled. And I think that um, the EPA, that was one of the first, the first things that they got stuck into, really. Yeah, yeah. Except that I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't think that their record is particularly good in relation to, to these matters. Mm -hmm. um, particularly when um, local authorities are to blame. Uh -huh. Because no public agency likes to blame another public agency right. yeah. as being the culprit in any situation. Uh -huh. So, you know, the EPA kind of, it seems to me, soft pedals it in uh -huh. relation to local authority responsibility for, for example, failure to manage 
particular landfill sites uh-huh. or, or failing to do this, that or the other in, in various other areas. And, and there are very few of those left now that the county run or the local controlled landfills. Right? Yes. There are very few of those. There left. are. It's there are. But I mean, it, you know, the thing has become centralized. And of right. course, now we're, we, we're, we have this uh, mega incinerator being built right. in Dublin, courtesy of the city manager, Owen Keegan, right. uh, who just simply decided, despite <coughs> the fact that the vast majority of councillors are totally opposed to it, uh-huh. um, to go ahead with the Covanta project in, in, in Pool Beg, uh-huh. and uh, which is going to have a capacity of 600,000 tonnes a year, and in all probability uh, will, will become, in effect, a national incinerator, you right. know, with all of that, all of the implications in terms of the traffic that that's going to generate from all sorts of places with these rubbish trucks heading for Pool Beg. Um, yeah. And in, in all probability, they're going to have to import waste to keep the fires burning there. And, and what else in the 90s? I mean, now, now we're talking about the beginnings of the Celtic Tiger too, correct? Yeah. <laughs> and so what impact was that having <clears throat> on, on environmental issues? Well, I think that, I think that when, the <clears throat> boom, when the boom really got underway, you know, uh, development became the priority uh-huh. you know and the environment was kind of shoved back into second place uh-huh. now okay there were requirements on developers you know uh, in many cases to do environmental impact statements mm-hmm. you know which is <coughs> at least a step forward mm-hmm. uh, um, but in general development mm-hmm. became became the priority and i always remember <coughs> bertie hearns you know um Bertie Aaron talking about the importance of sustainable development mm-hmm. and all the rest of it. And I remember saying to his advisor, Paddy Duffy, I said, the Taoiseach's understanding of sustainable development seems to me to be faulty. Mm-hmm. In the sense that he seems to believe that sustainable development means development that has to be sustained. <laughs> and Paddy Duffy said, exactly. <laughs> so in other words, Development, you know, as long as there were huge things happening everywhere, if possible, that was fine, you know, and to hell with their environmental impact. You know, the environment was just something that was, you know, just happened to be out there kind of thing. But that was not for real men. Real men wanted to get on with development. With big derricks and and big building machines. And big, yeah, (coughs) and tower cranes and all the rest of it, you know. And, you know, there was something revolting about that aspect of the boom. (laughs) Uh, uh-huh. in, in Ireland. It, there was also something uh-huh. terrible about what it did to us as a people. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I mean, I, I just think we lost uh-huh. all sense of perspective, uh-huh. really. Um, and that none of us, it, it seems to me, well, or hardly any of us, were capable of standing back from uh-huh. what was going on and uh-huh. saying, hang on a second. You know, because things were happening so fast that it was, imp- it was actually impossible journalistically to keep track of it all mm-hmm. because there was just too much going on yeah. you know and yeah. and you'd go to some place and the next thing oh my god mm-hmm. some huge development had just been finished and yeah. you would never have even heard of it before yeah. you know and you just said my god this is all just too much yeah you know yeah. and it was too much and i guess the one saving grace during that in the nice <coughs> was the eu who was coming out with a number of enforcement yes that's actions right. against it. Yeah. i think ireland at one point was yeah. the worst well indeed and um uh, uh, and of course the people who uh, uh, these actions were initiated from ireland yes you know usually by the likes of you know ne'er-do-wells like tony tony, tony lowe's and others yeah. uh, who had no fear in taking on the system uh-huh. um, but the, they were regarded as traitors uh-huh. by the government yeah. by the Department of the Environment, you know, like who, uh, you know, what right <coughs> do these people yeah. have to queer the pitch for us? Yeah. You know, what right have they got to go over to Brussels or Luxembourg or wherever and wash or hang out our dirty <coughs> linen yeah. on a European stage, you know, but that's what they were doing and rightly so. And it's as a result of those actions that we've had to take, um, I mean, for example, take the issue of septic tanks, right. you know, that had been ignored for decades, yes. you know, I mean, people who built houses in the countryside mm. which would show a, 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 a septic tank in, in the, you know, the, the bottom right-hand corner of the field uh-huh. uh, that they had built in. And that was that. Yeah. Like, there was no question of maintenance or no. anything else. No. Nobody even knew about maintenance. Yeah. Nobody even thought they needed to be maintained. Yeah. So, you know, it was as a result of an action taken uh, by Friends of the Irish Environment in relation to this uh-huh. that 
that would force the government to introduce a, 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 a kind of a quasi-licensing regime for uh-huh. septic tanks, um, including um, inspections mm-hmm. um, and a requirement to maintain uh-huh. these facilities. And is it fair to say too that the water charges, which is finally coming back to haunt the government, was in fact also uh, the influence of the outside um, yes. uh, financial bailout? Well, absolutely. Um, I mean, it would never have been done otherwise right. because we we did have water charges until 19, uh, 1977? No, 1997. 97, okay. And Brendan Howland uh, uh-huh. was Minister for the Environment at the time, and there was a danger that Joe Higgins was going to get elected in Dublin West uh-huh. um, as an independent socialist uh-huh. uh, TD. And uh, Howland abolished water charges as a, as a because it was a hot issue in Blanchestown and places like that. Uh-huh. Um, but Joe Higgins still got elected to the door, so it didn't work. Um, and then they had to eat humble pie and introduce water charges later on, and then went through this incredible kind of um, series of shambles. Um, yeah. It became known as the Omni Shambles of Irish Water um, because uh, of the way the whole thing was being set up yeah. and how they hadn't thought it out in advance. Um, and how really it was just another example, yet another example of numerous examples yeah. of um, the failure of joined up thinking in Irish government, really. And, and for them to be pulling back now, the whole rationale for water charges, would you would connect the price well, for the I consumption mean, and they've broken that connection? They've no, it's just ridiculous. Connection. I mean, yeah. you know, in this yeah. apartment, for example, yeah. um, we don't, we're not, our water consumption is not metered. No. You know, it's it, it's just based on an assessment. Uh-huh. There's, there's t- two or three people living here, therefore you're assessed on. You you get a bill based on the number of people uh-huh. and their assumed uh, consumption of water. But in fact, um, um, uh, in fact, you could. I I feel like writing to them and saying to Alan Kelly, in fact, and say, dear Mr. Kelly. Um, I could leave my taps, all of my taps, uh-huh. running all day and all night, uh-huh. and I'm still entitled to a water conservation grant of 100 euro. <laughs> Can you riddle me this? <laughs> I it mean, is, it's beyond belief. It is, it is quite, know, yeah, it is you know, quite. Because it is smoke and mirrors. Yeah, you know, yeah. That's what it is. Now, now in, in 2000, you become the environmental editor, okay? Uh, and. What's been the kind of focus, I suppose, it's probably obvious in terms since 2000 or so in terms of the, the issues, on the environmental issues? Well, is I think that um, uh, climate change obviously right. has, has been a major preoccupation yeah. um, and uh, I covered the first, um, well I was at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in, in 1992, but okay. the climate, the UN climate conference has only started in 1995 okay. um, in Berlin. Uh, when the first conference, COP1, uh, mm-hmm. was was chaired by Angela Merkel uh-huh. as the right. German environment minister. Oh, she right, was right. absolutely excellent. Was she? Yeah. And when the Saudis tried to screw it all up in, uh-huh. the, in the final session, uh-huh. and they were standing up to object to the adoption of a resolution which saw us on the way to Kyoto two years later, uh-huh. um, she just ignored them and she <laughs> says, I think that's all agreed. <laughs> that's it. You know, I thought she was great. I you know. forgot she was that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so I'm not surprised that she's become the kind of mother of Germany, as it were, you know, <laughs> since uh, as Chancellor. Um, so, and then, of course, there was an annual climate conference, mm-hmm. you know, um, uh, climate negotiations um, mm-hmm. that went on to, you know, Geneva, uh, Kyoto, right. um, um, you know, The Hague, Copenhagen, uh, Bonn, yes. Copenhagen, and God yeah. knows where else, you right. know. Um, the only one that um, that I uh, got serious ribbing about was when um, they held it in Bali uh-huh. one year. <laughs> and uh, we all went to Bali, needless to say, and it was, it was lovely. And then people would say, how come they, they, they hold these conferences so far away? And yeah. you say, well, actually, it doesn't really matter where they hold them, because uh-huh. for a lot of people in the world, uh-huh. wherever it is, it's going to be far away. Right. <laughs> so, you know, like it could be, this time it's in Paris, that's an, that's hour, right. an hour and 20 minutes flight from Dublin. That's right. You know, um, so that's very handy, really. Yeah. 
and um, I'm glad to say that I'll be there oh, you for will. COP21. Okay. Uh, I've rented an Airbnb flat um, uh, in the centre of Paris uh, for two weeks, and okay. I'm going to be there writing about it for the Irish Times. Oh, you'll be covering it for the Irish yes, Times? Yes, I will. So you still have on um, I do, assignments. but I, I did that deal with the editor. Right. I said, right. said look, I've you, covered... You, you volunteered for that, did you? Yeah, I did. I volunteered for that. I did. <laughs> Paris, did. Yes. Absolutely. I volunteered for If Paris. it was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, yeah. it's safe, so maybe no, I, not. I, I would have. Yeah. I still would have, because it's it's kind of, to me, it's almost like the end of that, the, the end of the first phase That's right. of dealing with climate change. Yeah. Now, I know it's taken an awful long time, yeah. but I think things are finally moving in the right direction, uh-huh. especially guess. in China and the United States. Yeah. And, and energy was the other. When I started Environmental uh, Prosecutor in 1980, we never talked about energy. Mm. Uh, and that's all we talk about now is climate change mm. and energy. Mm. That's uh, true, yeah. And energy is a huge issue. Well, it is, of course, a huge issue. And, yeah. and that's translated itself into a lot of um, opposition in Ireland um, and in other places to the indiscriminate building of wind farms right. all, over, all over the landscape. Yeah. Now, personally, I... I don't think that the Irish landscape can take all of this Mm -hmm. Uh, and I would much prefer to see uh, this stuff being installed offshore, Uh you know. Now what what it will take to in terms of tweaking the incentives to make that happen, Uh uh, I just don't know but uh, Uh I think that that's where the emphasis really should be and Uh also we need to we need to put the emphasis much more on energy conservation rather than on building new uh-huh. facilities all the time to cope with growing demand. Uh-huh. Demand can be cut yeah. instead by um, having a massive program, and I mean a seriously <laughs> massive program, yeah. of retrofitting um, uh, housing and other buildings um, to reduce our energy consumption. And that is happening on a small scale basis at the moment, but it needs to happen on a widespread and intensive way Uh over the next, say, 20 years uh, to bring the housing stock in particular, Uh but the general stock of buildings up to some kind of A rated energy standard where and that would that would what that would mean, in effect, is that we wouldn't then need all of the power that we're now planning to build, uh, uh, including the transmission lines, Uh you know, and the pylons pylons, marching across the landscape, as Charlie Hoy used to complain. Um, You know, I mean, there there are more ways to skin a cat than building power stations. Where where do you see fundamental changes that have happened over those 35 years of your tenure at the Times? What are the most important? Is it in the, the audience? Is it in the... Uh, uh, the way in which stories are told or what stories are told? As far as uh, uh, coverage of stuff is concerned, I mean, uh, I think newspapers are at a a very critical stage uh, at the moment. Um, You know, I am, am, if I was to define myself, I would say I'm a newspaper man. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm, uh, I'm not sure that I fall into the other the other. I mean, I've had to adapt, you know, but uh-huh. it would it would pain me to see um, papers dying right. uh, as a result of the internet penetration that currently exists, uh-huh. and you know, people getting their news from Facebook and Twitter and other social media. Uh-huh. Um, I think that that the n- newspapers still have a major role to play, uh-huh. uh, but I'm not sure that they're 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 really doing that anymore. Um, I mean, it's a matter of personal regret to me that the Irish Times no longer sees itself as the paper of record. Uh So that, uh, and what that means effectively is that there are a whole lot of things happening that are, that should be reported, Mm -hmm. that aren't being reported Mm -hmm. because there's some popsy thing that you need to get in or some celeb thing that you need to get in or Mm -hmm. some other dross or junk that you need to fill the pages with, Mm -hmm. you know, instead. Mm -hmm. Um, And as a result, I think newspapers, and I would include the Irish Times in this, are in danger of losing whole constituencies Mm -hmm. of readers, you know, people who've been loyal to a particular paper for a long, long time, Mm -hmm. um, will give up reading it if if they perceive that the issues that concern them Uh are not being covered. Uh And that, unfortunately, is increasingly the case. Now, is some of that change uh, being forced because of the uh, online version of the the newspaper, you think? Yes, of course. That's triggering that 
Of course it is. They need to be more visual and... Yeah, I have no problem with with yeah. that, uh-huh. you know, with uh, the online presence, etc., etc. Uh-huh. But the whole thing is now driven by what's known as news now. Uh-huh. You know, in other words, the paper that gets produced every day is just a kind of a, a snapshot uh-huh. in time of okay. of a whole throughput of news that goes through uh, the online uh, website. Uh-huh. There's too much of a devotion to entertainment mm-hmm. rather than information. The Rupert Murdoch model. Yeah, and if, that if you were to strip out, you know, the serious columnists like Fintan O'Toole and others mm-hmm. out of the Irish Times, what would you be left with? Right. Right. Ask yourself. But I mean, yeah. sometimes I do fear that, you know, that I'm among the last generation that can trace their, their professional ancestry back to Gutenberg. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really disturbed by that thought. Instead of Apple. In, well, exactly. Yeah. Um, I was in the Arctic, I'm glad to say. I mean, it was one of the, one of the weird things um, about becoming environment editor or environment correspondent of the Irish Times originally that you know, I didn't really think about this aspect of it, but it did become a kind of a ticket to see the world. Uh-huh. And so you get invited to go to different things. So the European Environment Agency invited us to East Greenland uh-huh. uh, in 2006. And that was fascinating, uh-huh. really, to be up close and personal, not with polar bears, but just with melting glaciers, yeah. you know, and hear the water trickle. Yeah. Yeah, and it's trickling faster and faster. And it's trickling faster, faster and faster. faster. And it's a very serious um, issue, which, of course, the small <laughs> island states, in mainly in the Pacific and the mm-hmm. Caribbean, places like that, are very hot about because they yeah. know uh, that it's an existential threat for yeah. them. It's not specifically <clears throat> an existential threat for Ireland, yeah. but it's a matter of great regret and, 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 dis- and deep dismay to me uh-huh that the, the, <coughs> the climate change and low carbon development bill is so constricted um, yeah. and refuses to set realistic targets <coughs> for uh, the future mm. and also refuses to set individual targets for different sectors of the economy. And the yeah. reason for this is simple. Mm-hmm. It's because they want the whole agricultural sector to expand. Yes. So it's inevitable that no, that, that what that means is that mm. no target for reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture in Ireland can be set right. in a situation where production, the doubling of production right. is what is envisaged. Right. So, you know, they they just won't face up to <coughs> it. Um, and, and okay, there are some people who say, <coughs> you know, Ireland is a small little country mm. compared to China mm. or the United States. Mm. So what? Right. Our per capita emissions are much higher yeah. than most countries in the world. Yeah. And yeah. we need to deal with that. Yeah. And that involves dealing <laughs> with agriculture on a fair yeah. and equitable basis rather than showing it outright and outrageous favouritism, which is what's happening at the moment. Now, you know, Frank, one of the things that, that, that bothers many of us uh, is, is that passion. I remember in your first interview, you, you, said, you started out and you said, when you started out, you were just a pissed off kid. <laughs> and you still are. <laughs> you're still a kid, you're still pissed off. And that passion, uh, I think we're all concerned about, isn't in the Irish Times. And and what's your sense of the future of the Irish Times coverage of environmental matters? Well, um, when I officially retired, um, because I came to the shocking age of 65 last January, um, I spoke to the editor, Kevin O'Sullivan, and I asked him, um, I said, I presume that there's no delay in appointing an environment correspondent. Mm. And he said, no, of course not. And um, But eight months later, we still haven't got one. And yeah. I, I think that is that is something <coughs> that is a shame and, and arguably a disgrace and reflects very badly on the Irish Times. I mean, it should be self-evidently the case that, you know, uh, people, a lot of people who read the Irish Times yeah. are concerned about issues to do with the environment. And whereas those constituencies, if you like, might be smaller than those who want to read about celebrities, mm-hmm. they're still important. Yes. And if you continually fail to cover issues of concern to those different constituencies, mm-hmm. you're going to lose readers, particularly of the newspaper. Now, forgetting the future of the Irish Times, the more important future is your own. Okay. Ah. And what do we expect of that? We know the memoirs are being written. Is there a working title? 
Well, I have a title in my... I, 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 I had a title in my head. Um, you don't need to share because I know sometimes that's a difficult... No, 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 I have no problem doing that. Um, I think um, uh, the first book that I did was The Destruction of Dublin mm -hmm. and my good, very good friend Shane O'Toole um, suggested, do you know what, you could call your memoirs The Distraction of Dublin. And I said, that's a very clever pun altogether. <laughs> But in fact, it wouldn't be accurate because right. there's a whole lot of stuff in it about other things right. that have nothing to do with Dublin at all. Right. Right. And so I think I might call it Dublin and other distractions. <laughs> and what does it do, do for publication? Autumn of next year. Autumn of next year. And who's yeah. publishing it? Penguin Ireland. Right. Be sure and buy it, please. Frank, thanks for talking with us. Not at all. Always a pleasure. And you too, Bob. <laughs>